This one's got a pretty good tail. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Let's go ahead and see what's sleeping inside this mid-2000s Gibson case. That's right, it's one for the lefties. Ever since we reviewed that lefty double neck on the channel, it just made me realize how much I actually enjoy trying to play left-handed guitars as a flipped instrument like this. All your strings are backwards, it just makes all your regular shapes not work, so you have to kind of figure out how to play the stuff. I find it a lot of fun, it helps bring you out of a rut if you happen to be stuck in one. But this is a 2005 Gibson Les Paul Standard Plus. What does the plus mean? It means we've got this beautiful figure top. Not all of them were quite as nice as this in the regular lineup. But I got an email from a viewer of the show saying, hey, I was gifted this guitar by Gibson back in the 2000s, and it sat in his closet from brand new and has never really been played. He is a left-handed guy, but he does not play guitar. So what's the story here? Why would Gibson give a guitar to somebody who doesn't even play the instrument? That's where things get interesting. So back in the mid-2000s, there was a show called Rockstar, where it would help bands find new lead singers, kind of in Big Brother slash American Idol style, where they would have 15 of the top vocalists all over the world come together to compete for the band's attention. That's how Australian rock band In Excess found their new lead singer after the untimely death of their original one. They brought us hit songs like New Sensation and Devil Inside. And punk rock Supernova was for season two. Today, you can find the entire series on YouTube. There's like 32 episodes each season. It's basically just really cool cover songs. I actually enjoyed it a lot. But David, the guy who reached out to me, was one of the producers of the show. And Gibson was a sponsor of it, so they gifted him this guitar at the end of the second season because they knew he was a lefty and that he didn't play guitar, but maybe they were hoping he would learn after all this? But we know how that tale ended. It was mainly just a closet trophy piece for him. And he says the only time this was played was when Hoffa, the lead guitarist of the house band of that show, as well as being part of the current show, The Voice, asked him to test it at a guitar center before he decided to list it. I thought that was really cool that he shared that photo with us because when I was skimming through the episodes, what impressed me the most was not necessarily the vocalists. I mean, that's just not my thing. This is a guitar channel. I'm very gear centered. So I was, you know, looking at all the instruments people were playing, but I was just so impressed by their musicianship. They had a wide range of songs that they had to be able to play back to back to back to back that night. Or maybe that's just editing magic, but that was pretty cool. Now, unfortunately, this wasn't part of the show so it's not like when we documented this guitar that was burnt on the television show just shoot me but still a pretty fascinating story to tie in with reviewing another left-handed guitar on my show now being a gift i was kind of curious what kind of case candy we might have we do indeed have a lefty pick guard if we wanted to install it we've got the owner's manual and combo lock sheet for the case but here's the big one, pre-packed checklist warranty card thing. Was it filled out? No. And hey, we also have the truss rod tool. And the case itself is actually pretty nice. So this is back when they have the kind of gator exterior to them. They're made in Canada and proud about it. They put the stickers. It's the nice rope handles. As long as they don't come unstapled in there, usually they hold up very well. And it's right before they get rid of the combo lock, keeping the innocent innocent, as they say. But this one's never been set. However, it's not early enough to have a case shroud. They had just did away with that on standard production. But we still have that beautiful charcoal blackish gray interior. Well, there we go. Unique story behind a left-handed guitar, because, yeah, I'm not going to do that much justice playing it. But that's what my show's about. It's about the stories and the histories of each individual instrument, as well as their parts and specs, rather than showcasing how good or bad of a guitar player I am. <laughs> so let's go ahead and throw this one on the workbench and do what I do. Nearly two decades in a case, it needed a little bit of a polish, but here we are. So unfortunately, our pickup covers are tarnished. How this happened is somebody had something on their hands that touched it up at one point in time, they left it on, and it just sat there, and it eventually just ate the coating. Because this is after all my usual polishing and things like that. I even used my slightly more aggressive cleaner, but that's just permanently on there. It's not just dirty. But let's see what pickups we have in here. We've got a Burst Bucker 1 wound by Fanseri in the neck, and a Burst Bucker number 2 in the bridge. Same with the Alnico 5 magnets. It's just what these usually came with. But here's our neck pickup cavity. Nice clean routes on this one, marked DB for Desert Burst. 
And then in our bridge pickup cavity, we have LP6 for Les Paul 60s, then a plus for the plus top. And I was sitting here scratching my head, what could that L mean? I haven't seen that before. Lefty. Which, speaking of it being a lefty, it was so polarizing cleaning this guitar up. Because that double neck we recently did, I'm not really that intimate with double necks. But Les Pauls, I've cleaned over a thousand of those things at this point, so it is very strange, but familiar at the same time. But when you open it up, you get to see your wire channel cavity route right there on this side, rather than hidden over here, it's strange. But then over here, I'm used to seeing something right there where it goes to your control cavity. But on this one, it's hiding on the opposite side. Lefties don't get to have as much fun online, so here's one for you guys. I was surprised how many left-handed commenters we had on the last double neck video. But I've got to say, this is one of the nicer tops on one of this era's Les Paul standards I've seen. Like, sometimes they can be kind of meh. But since, you know, it's within the Plus family, I guess I'm not all that surprised, but just a little bit of history here. Before the 50s and 60s standards came out in the new original collection in 2019, if you wanted a Les Paul standard that was traditionally specced, this is the era you would go for. Some guys say late 90s. Personally, I say 2001 to 2005 is that sweet spot. Early 2006 also works, however, for the 2007 model year, which came out halfway through 2006, that's when they start the chambering weight relief. So this one still just has the regular nine holes. So nowadays you have to decide between, do you want one that has like about two decades worth of aging to it and you don't mind the nine hole weight relief, or do you want one of the modern 50, 60 standards? Cause they're great. I will argue that these 2000s one have one thing over the current generation is they use the historic style small Klusen tuners. Now these aren't always the best tuners, but this set actually feels pretty good. But the modern ones have the screw on bushings rather than the historic push-in style. So that's one reason why you still might consider one of these in 2024. Another reason is wood quality. Sometimes you can find quilty and flamed mahogany backs. Well, that's enough bonus history. Let's go ahead and grab our pickup readings. That bridge is 8.07k ohms, neck position 765, and the middle just for fun here, 3.93. It has our regular two volumes and two tone controls, one for each pickup set. And as is common, you've got a little bit of internal cracking on that knob. However, the other ones, I didn't really see too much of anything. Doesn't mean that they won't crack in shipping or anything. That's very common. And of course, our three-way toggle switch over here. We've got a small scuff at the top of the switch tip. And here's another light difference between the current day standards. These older ones use a Nashville style bridge, PW branded, and you've got the bushing within the body. The new ones have an ABR1 sitting on top of like Nashville style studs. So it's not a huge difference, but something to know about. And we've got a full weight tailpiece on this. You can see the hard weight to the pickup covers. It's got some tarnishing to it. And again, that is after cleaning. So if you're a lefty looking for the rare opportunity to buy something from me, and you think you're just gonna be able to clean that off, no, unfortunately not. But moving on from our nine hole weight relief body with the two piece flame maple top, we've got the mahogany neck with the rosewood fretboard. Yeah, let's just say that thing needed some serious treatment, but it's looking peachy now. Nice and even, dark polish those frets up because they need some help and we're going to put some new strings on it. But very minimal to no play wear here. Got your acrylic trapezoid inlays. With a 1.69 inch nut width. Increasing to 2.08 by the 12. This is the 60s neck version at 0.83 first fret neck depth. And about 0.89 by the 12th. Here's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. Just a C shape but slim. Now it's important to note they didn't call them 50s and 60s standards like today. It was just a Les Paul standard with a 60s style neck or a 50s style neck. And originally they did have these little doofy stickers on the truss rod cover. However, most people end up removing them. So it's kind of nice that this one still has that. But the truss rod's looking good on this one. Uh, look at this headstock. I'm curious if they gave this to them because they messed up the headstock. Because this silk screen is just way too low. Like it needs to be about an inch higher. But we still have the Gibson Mother or Pearl logo. And if you catch it in the light just right, you can see the owner had left a clip-on tuner on this for an extended period of time. And it kind of slightly impressed the finish. I actually noticed it on the back before I did on the front. It is visible if you get it in the light though. This is where things get strange because now it looks normal to us righties. 
But even for the lefties, I technically have this setup wrong on my bench. I just didn't feel like switching everything up. Uh, yeah, our control cavity is over here. Uh, we can see factory solder work with our Gibson branded pots. Everything looks the way I would expect to see in here. And here's our toggle switch cavity. Check this out. You don't see that every day. Plastic still over top of the back plate on a mid 2000s standard. Now the back is not black. I don't really want to say it's a dark red color either. I would say it's kind of a reddish brown. Not quite the same as a custom shop dark back, but we do have a pretty sizable scratch right here that's straight into the clear coat. You can feel that. Otherwise it's mainly just polishing swirls and you know being a dark finished guitar. I saw a small blemish over here, maybe a few other light edge dings. Then it must have had a strap on it in the case or something because you've got a lot of scuffs right here along the edge. And the typical lacquer line right here, exposing the thin binding in the cutaway. And other light lacquer sink areas like right there. But moving on from the body, we can go to the neck. I mean, it's got some minor impressions here or there and very light scratches. However, there is quite a sizable ding right here. Which is a little bit of a bummer. So when I advertise this one, I call it 8.5 out of 10 on an aggressive scale. Something similar to that. It's in pretty good shape here. Outside of the big ding on the neck, that scratch on the back, and right here you can see the other side of that impression I was talking about from a tuner. But we have a serial number dating to 2005, 202nd day of the year. Initial batch, production number looks like 373. Because another fun thing to note is the Chibsons are based off of these style Les Paul standards. All said and done, this one's chunky, 10 pounds, 6.8 ounces. Not uncommon in this era, despite the nine hole weight relief. But let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it kinda sounds. Well, there we go, a lefty Les Paul standard from the year 2005 with a beautiful top and a really interesting story behind how it left the factory and who it went to. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed us having some fun. I can't necessarily review it. I thought it sounded pretty good from what I was able to demo of it. But if you're looking for a little bit of inspiration, go to a store, pick up a left-handed one, and j just noodle around. Sometimes familiar shapes, righty played on a lefty, kind of gives you like this interesting tone. Like Sweet Child of Mine reversed is like this weird, happy but yet scary robotic bucket head thing. I thought that was fun. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. 
you're interested in being the next owner of this left-handed Les Paul, you can find it for sale on my website, TrogglesGuitarShow.com. Otherwise, we will catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.